Asteroid mining. Sounds like something out of science fiction, right? Well, there's one company that's working to make this a reality. Find out more in today's episode. Three, two, one. Engine full power. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Hello, and thanks for joining me today for Your Space Journey. I'm your host, Chuck Fields, and today we're going to speak with Joe Sersel, the CEO and founder of TransAstra. TransAstra is a pioneering space company that is shaping the future of space exploration. Joel is a renowned expert in the field of space resource utilization and has been at the forefront of developing innovative technologies to harvest resources from the moon and asteroids. Today we'll be discussing how TransAstra plans to engineer the future of space by tapping into the vast resources available in space. We'll explore the company's latest breakthroughs, the challenges and opportunities involved in space mining, and what this means for the future of space exploration and the sustainability of our planet. Your space journey. Hi, Chuck. Joel, it's nice to meet you. I have to say, though, um, my wife was was really happy that I was interviewing you too because her name is Dawn, and uh, we always talk oh, about the, fantastic. Yeah, we always joke about the spacecraft Dawn and how uh, it was. You had nice. a little something to do with it. Tell tell me more about that. I yes. love that. Uh, Dawn was a spacecraft that used the N star ion propulsion system to go and explore the asteroids Vesta and Ceres. And NSTAR is a system that I started when I was J at JPL in the early 1990s, nice. when I was the program manager for advanced spacecraft technology at JPL. So it was based on a um, 30 centimeter gridded ion engine that uh, Dr. John Brophy at JPL had become the development of. And um, he came into my office one, now, one, one day talking to me about uh, a mission concept for a main belt asteroid mission that would use this 30 centimeter ion engine in a five kilowatt mode uh, and uh, to, to do a really cool mission to the asteroids. And I said, well, what if we made an affordable mission by derating the, the engine to two and a half kilowatts instead? It would be a lot cheaper to flight qualify and we could put it on a Delta launch vehicle and make an affordable discovery class mission. And that led to the NSTAR program, which was the NASA's solar electric propulsion Technology Application Readiness Program, which oh. is an unfortunate nested acronym <laughs> that I invented. Nice. Um, where we qualified, we flight qualified ion propulsion for deep space application for the first time. We flew it in a flight demonstration mission on the New Millennium Deep Space One spacecraft, and then it became baseline for dawn. Oh. See, I, I always thought that was incredible. I was, I grew up thinking how amazing ion propulsion would be. So when Dawn came along, I thought that was incredible. And when I heard you were uh, the one behind uh, the propulsion on on that, I thought that was incredible. So you have this vast background that I am uh, incredibly impressed by. And I was just wondering, you know, we obviously this is called your space journey. So we'd love to hear what what, what motivated you to get into this amazing field. Um, it never really occurred to me to work in any other field. Um, when I was a kid growing up uh, in many different places, because my family moved around a lot, but mm -hmm. many of my formative years were, were uh, from growing up in Arizona, where we lived in the desert. Dark skies. And um, the night skies were incredible. And my family did a lot of um, camping. We would... Um, my father was an Air Force fighter pilot, and um, we we would uh, so so for me the idea of seeing someone in your family rocketing through the night sky as a little kid, there was this like not distinct boundary between the sky and the earth, and when we would sit outside by the campfire looking up at the incredible stars and the milky way galaxy and uh uh i i was just never born with this concept of separation between space and earth that most people have right and um and uh and then i got in i, I was always sort of interested in technical things and how things work and mm -hmm. making things you know like i would um design and build my own 
you know, model airplanes that and fly them and powered by all different things from rubber bands to rocket engines. And um, uh, I became fascinated with science and engineering and science fiction. Science fiction really got me hooked early. And um, uh, it just never occurred to me that that humanity should stay on the earth. And then and and uh, also, uh, you know, I was a little kid at the time that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Uh, it was a very, it was a very hot day in Arizona, and our air conditioner happened to be out. Oh wow! Um, and uh, that left a, that that whole experience left a lasting impression. And I just assumed that you know by now uh, we'd have you know towns and villages on the moon, and I would be a part of it. Um, so, uh, uh, and and it, it became very clear to me that the Earth is this tiny dot floating in the cosmos, and that um, you start to learn about human beings and what we are and who we are. One of my early influences was, was Carl Sagan, who wrote a whole panoply of very excellent science books for general audience uh when i was more when i was a teenager later on in life and um uh and he and others pointed out that you know human beings have evolved from hunter gatherers we're instinctively hunter gatherers we explore new territories and we 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 um, expand to fill any ecological niche and when that one is full we go to the next one and we've done that we've we've completely covered the earth human beings live in virtually every terrestrial biome on the earth you know from the Sahara to the arctic you know to the jungle and um and it's now time to make the leap into the cosmos could not agree with and, you more uh, and so that you know it, it just those things were just axiomatic to me mm-hmm. like it never occurred to me that there was a different way and so to be part of taking that step into the cosmos so that we can have an unlimited future you know this this concept of sustainability a lot of people talk about sustainability and it means less 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 mm-hmm. like there's a fix some some game but huna- humanity has never been a fix some game species we always create more and the only way we can do that is we step out into the cosmos and har- harness the, the resources of space. Probably too long of an answer, but what the heck? No, no, it, it was good because you do have an amazing background, and I share a lot of those passions with you. Um, but in addition to your amazing experience at, G- at JPL, uh, I want to talk about, of course, this this awesome company that you uh, founded called Trans, uh, technically Trans Astronautica Corporation. Uh, we'll shorten that to Trans Astra. You formed that in 2015. Can you tell us more about the mission and mission and vision behind Trans Astra? Yeah. So at the time that I formed, but just before I formed Trans Astra, mm-hmm. I uh, back in those days I was a, a technology and management consultant. I'd actually spent a couple of years not so much in the space industry because space was frankly boring. It was going slow. It was a government thing. Um, you know, like organizations like JPL or then the Air Force or, you know, the NRO, uh, they spend more and more every year, not JPL, but NASA. Mm-hmm. They spend more and more every year and kind of do not that much more or even less for the dollar. Um, you know, and it got to the point where, you know, like a typical JPL Mars lander cost a million dollars a kilogram to build. That's just not sustainable. Right. Um, and, um, so I really felt as though humanity was off the rails in terms of its direction towards its inevitable destiny in space. Um, and I come up as a follower of Gerard O'Neill. He gave me my first ever consulting contract. Oh, wow. He was the guy who started the L5, the, the Space Studies Institute, invented the concept of, um, uh, space settlements, right. uh, made out of asteroids and lunar materials. And, um, but in order for all that to happen, you have to have low cost reusable launch. Mm-hmm. And that just wasn't, you know, the space shuttle was a failure from that perspective. Right. It was very expensive, unreliable, not routine launch. And so the visions of building space solar, solar power satellites, building um, habitats for humanity in space and spreading throughout the solar system, they were just dead in the water. And, and, but a customer on the East Coast 
hired me to do a deep dive on SpaceX. Should we buy their rockets? And, um, and so I got to know some of the executives at SpaceX, a lot of the engineers, did a deep dive on all their engineering processes, the design and vision for the Falcon 9. At that point, they would had like two or three Falcon 9 launches, one <laughs> failure. And um, I came away from it thinking, okay, now it's going to happen. We're going to have low-cost reusable launch. SpaceX is going to do it, and then one or two more companies will do it. By the way, we need one or two more companies to do it also. Otherwise, the prices Agreed. won't come down. Agreed. That's how free markets work. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I said, well, what's the most important thing you could do, Joel, to help humanity get into space? And the answer was solve critical technologies associated with asteroid mining. And there are four critical problems associated with asteroid mining. One, we have to find more asteroids. We've only found like 0.04% of the near-Earth asteroids. Yeah, it's incredible. And uh, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. We need to find a significant fraction of the near-Earth asteroids so that statistically we know where the ones that are easy to get to are. Mm -hmm. Number two, we need better in-space transportation technology. Because while reusable rockets are great for getting to space, we need faster, more cost-effective, you know, cheaper, better in-space transportation. Mm -hmm. Number three, when you get to an asteroid, you have to be able to capture it in a bag because you can't land on an asteroid. That's a misnomer. Right. There's no gravity to speak of to land on an asteroid. And if you grab something to try and hold on to an asteroid, it'll come off in your hand exactly. and make a big pile of dust and you'll be <laughs> floating. And it's just a mess. Uh -huh. um, and then number four, we need to learn to harness sunlight more effectively in space. Sunlight is not a very reliable power source here on the Earth, but in space, it's tremendous. In space, um, you know, every, you know, two thirds of a square meter of sunlight gives you 240 kilowatt hours of energy a day. Here on the Earth, after knockdown factors and everything, um, you, you're lucky to get 30 kilowatt hours in California, which is about the best possible place. So those are the four basic problems. And so I started inventing technologies to solve those problems and um, looked around to see who could take something that's basically a new idea, and turn it into something practical. Um, turns out venture doesn't do that. They take things that are already proven and turn, them in, yeah. turn it into businesses. So it wasn't venture capital. Um, it's not DARPA because they just work on defense-related problems. Mm -hmm. And so I looked around and there's a program in NASA called NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. Mm. It turns out it's yes. the most competitive program for engineers, um, but it's the one where you can come with a breakthrough idea. And if you can prove that it'll is likely to work, it's feasible, it's a breakthrough, and you have a plan to make it work, and that has a big impact on NASA's mission, they'll fund you with a grant to go out and make it happen. So I started writing proposals to NIAC and uh, was very lucky started winning those. And over the years, I became the only seven-time NIAC fellow. I've won wow. seven fellowships from that NIAC, won, won about $4 million. And so we took those four problems and turned it into about 20 inventions that are either patented or patent pending. We anticipate having about 20 patents by the end of this year. And um, we proved them. We took them from the early concept to proof of concept. And those have all been proven in our laboratories here at Caltech now. Can and we, then uh, from that, go ahead. I was going to say, Joel, I, I am impressed by by the patent and by just some of the ideas that you have so far. Uh, I was wondering if I would just nice. talk on this a little bit. One of which, of course, the worker bee space tugs. I want to talk about this. But the omnivore solar thermal rocket, I think it's ingenious. It's sure. sunlight, water, it's propellant. That's amazing. Can you tell us some more about that and how you came up with that? Well, the reason it's not just water. So it's um, originally we, we said, well, we need a propulsion system that can use water because we can harvest water at the asteroids. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do asteroid mining, you need to harvest the propellant for the return trip when you get there. Right. But it, we call it the omnivore because it can work on just about anything. And the water you get from an asteroid is not nice, clean water. It's more like dirty, mucky, nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. So the omnivore is designed to work on that or virtually any other fluid. Um, the other thing is the omnivore can also um, can also work as a chemical rocket engine. So you can feed it oxidizer and fuel, and it'll run as a chemical rocket. Wow. And then oxidizer, you can run on just fuel. And when you run on just fuel, you get much higher specific impulse, much higher um, efficient use of the propellant per unit mass. Um, and if you run it on liquid hydrogen, 
you can get a, a very high performance close to a nuclear rocket, um, but it's just clean, safe solar power. So we're very excited about it. We have two different versions of the omnivore thruster really? in the lab here. In fact, out in the parking lot today, we have a uh, solar concentrator that's this beautiful sunny day here in Southern California. And they're actually testing our Mark II engine with sunlight today. Nice. We don't always test them with sunlight because sunlight is unreliable mm -hmm. uh, here on the ground. Uh, we test them in large vacuum chambers where we have huge solar simulators that simulate sunlight. We concentrate that simulated sunlight down into a little circle and pump that into the engines to run the engines. Um, but today they happen to be doing a real tests with sunlight. Wow. Joel, I, I think that's incredible. And, and what I, I have to say I'm really impressed about uh, Transastra is sort of the vision, sort of a, the tiered vision of, you know, let's, let's do the inv invest these time and energy in developing these technologies that can really make a difference. But also, let's start with, of course, propulsion. Um, then let's start with space tugs. You know, let's, let's get um, focus on moving satellites between orbits. And then after that, let's focus on asteroid mining. I was just wondering sort of the, the big picture of what are the s steps that, that TransAster is taking to kind of solve these problems? Well, the, uh, the first that? step, you see this picture right here? Yes. This is one of our telescopes. This is, um, this is an operational stutter telescope. Um, this particular one happens to be operating, that's the real night sky behind it. Wow. at an observatory uh, outside of uh, Tucson, Arizona, just north of the Mexican border. Mm -hmm. And we operate that routinely when the weather's good. And uh, if we get a week of good, uh, clear nights, um, you know, we'll, we will find and track thousands of asteroids. And, um, and we can track an object down to the size of uh, a washing machine with this telescope wow. with, out to two lunar distances. So, and, and unlike, it's easy to find, like if someone tells you, hey, there's a spacecraft in this particular orbit, it's easy to point pr pretty much any, any telescope at that and find a spacecraft out to a couple of lunar distances. Because mm -hmm. you can stare at it, you know what its trajectory is, and you can take a long exposure. But our technology allows us to find satellites that you didn't know were there. Um, because we, we, we developed the Sutter Telescope. It's named after Sutter's Mill, when the, where they discovered gold. Gold rush, That yeah. led to the California gold rush. Nice. So we intend to find enough asteroids to lead to a uh, gold rush to space. I love it. <laughs> um, but what's really cool about it is we have a business right now. We've got about $3 million in Space Force contracts nice. to help Space Force use that um, to help for Space Force find and track spacecraft in cislunar space. Geo, XGO. Mio, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, each one of our te te technologies is part of our roadmap to get to asteroid mining, but each one has near-term revenue. And, um, you know, a lot of, some of our investors care a lot about the vision. Investors, we were talking to one today that I, I think they'll probably be investing a couple million dollars here in the next few weeks. They Great. said, we're very excited about your vision, but that's not why we're investing. We're investing because um, we're very excited about all these technologies and what their near-term business pops possibilities are. And I'm very happy with that because yes. we're, we're building a business with real revenue now so that we can scale the business. And then as the business scales, we will build bigger and bigger spacecraft and we'll have all these pieces. And when it all comes together, we'll use it for asteroid mining. So, for example, the Sutter Telescope is step one. The omnivore propulsion system is step two, that, and we'll be, um, assuming this investor comes through, I think they probably will, um, we'll name our first uh, omnivore space test flight after them, um, and we'll demonstrate the omnivore engine in space, and then we'll use that as an orbit transfer vehicle to carry payloads in low Earth orbit and payloads from LEO to GEO and so on. Um, but then a tie, tied to that that, cat, that uh, orbit transfer vehicle will be our capture bag. So um, out in the laboratory, we have a subscale model of an asteroid capture bag. Mm -hmm. We originally developed it with NASA funding as a subscale demonstrator of how we could capture a giant thousand ton asteroid. Well, it turns out this little capture bag is perfect for picking up orbital debris in low Earth orbit. And it turns out it has fundamental advantages over any of the other approaches that people have proposed for cleaning up orbital debris. A lot of the other approaches involve grappling with the debris, grabbing it with an arm, 
docking with it, all these kinds of stuff. Very difficult proximity operations. Right. Whereas with our capture bag, we can come up to a piece of orbital debris that might be tumbling and just open the bag around the tumbling object, close the bag, cinch it down tight, and uh, and and take it to a processing facility in orbit or um, deorbit it in a controlled way. What a great and that's concept. a huge... That's yeah, a, it really that's is. A, that is actually, over the next 10 years, that's a multi-billion dollar business unto itself. Um, and um, and then as we get really good at that with our orbit transfer vehicles, we use our telescopes to find the debris, just mm-hmm. as we use our telescopes to find asteroids. We use our orbit transfer vehicles to carry our capture bags to go clean up the debris. We can do that on commercial contracts from people so that they can get that FAA certification for launch for their, const- their, their orbital constellations. We can deliver satellites to their orbital destinations using our orbit transfer vehicles, then pick them up at end of life, bring them back for resurfacing uh, or deorbiting. And so those are, those are big businesses of the 2020s right now that our investors care a lot about. But our secret nefarious plan is to build these big businesses, but then build the architecture for asteroid mining because that's a trillion dollar business. That's really what we're here for. Oh, Joel, that's incredible. And, and you had me at capture bags for one. Um, those really intrigue me. And you mentioned. Would you your- like to see the capture bag? Oh, I'd love to see the capture bag. That'd be incredible. Yeah. So maybe you can get a little tour of our, of our facility here at Trans Astra. So this is what we call the hive. Here's oh, nice. the office space where our engineers, our engineers were all just in a meeting in our mural area here. Excellent. Um, this is a mural that captures, it's on the ceiling and walls of our main oh, conference space. And it captures our vision of all the different missions that we're planning. Eventually, we hope to build worlds in space like that. And then Incredible. there's the laboratory. So if you look right there, see that black sphere? I do. That's a micro. That is a basically a black beach ball that we use for microgravity simulations of miniature asteroids and orbital debris. If you see that canister with the soft goods in it, that's our inflatable capture bag. Oh my gosh. In the distance over there, you see those vacuum tanks. Those are our test facilities. And you see the door to the, to the high bay is open and back. See that white tent in the background? Barely, yes. Back there is where we have our solar reflector that we're doing our omnivore tests in. Oh, so, uh, that is incredible. So uh, that gives you a little idea of what it's like at Transaster. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, Joel, I thank you for the tour. And one thing that you mentioned earlier, too, and I'd love to explain to have you explain this in a little bit more detail, to the typical mindset of people on asteroids, on asteroid mining, you mentioned it. it you don't just land on the asteroid. It's not going to happen. But uh, I was wondering if you could explain more how, I guess, the worker bee is going to come and then deploy the capture bag, actually you know, match the tumbling rate of the asteroid. Just how does that, how does that work? Sure. Sure. So first of all, I'll give you our, our branding and our nomenclature. So our asteroid mining and space logistics architecture is called APIS. APIS is the genus, genus name for honeybees. Um, so our orbit transfer vehicles, our space trucks are called worker bees. Mm-hmm. We have three types of worker bees, three sizes of worker bees that we're planning. We're going to go from small to medium to large. Small ones are, could fit easily in the back of a pickup truck. Um, they can fit on a, con- on, a, on a small desk. We have a prototype of a worker bee one out in the laboratory right now. Um, so this is th- these are typically propelled with water, although they can be refueled in space with other propellant, refilled in space, resupplied in space with other propellants. Could be hydrazine, water, um, and you get different performance on different propellants. Um, worker B2 is a pickup tri- truck size system. So it's about the mass and size of a big communication satellite. Okay. We can fit three of those on a Falcon, on a full Falcon 9. That's Worker B2. Mm-hmm. And each one can deliver satellites to different orbital destination. And then Worker B3 is a super heavy scale system for really moving massive payloads in space. This is when we're building massive um, space settlements, which we will be doing sooner than you think, and things and massive structures that produce gigawatts of power in space, that sort of thing. This will come, I think, sooner than people expect. Worker B1, Worker B2, Worker B3. If you put a capture bag on a Worker B, then you get 
a honeybee class vehicle. Mm-hmm. So a small worker bee with a small capture bag, like the one I just showed you. And that capture bag actually is sized for the worker bee that we have out in the lab. That's actually out in the parking lot with an omnivore test today. Um, but that capture bag actually fits on that worker bee. And that becomes our mini bee system. That's for small orbital debris cleanup and demonstrating asteroid mining technology in low Earth orbit. A bigger capture bag that can capture something as large as 30 feet across, um, that goes on worker B2, and that makes our honeybee class system. Honeybee, a third, a, an asteroid that's thir- on, on the order of 30, 35 feet across, has a mass of 500 to 1,000 tons. Mm. We can launch a honeybee class system with a capture bag on a Falcon 9 to go out and capture a 1,000 ton class asteroid. Wow. That's about as big as a house. And it can harvest about 100 tons of water, which would have a value today um, of about $750 million. The reason we know that is because we have a contract with a publicly traded company to deliver 100 tons of water to GEO for $750 million. I can't say what company that is. Sure, of course. Um, And then eventually, everything in space will go super heavy class. And so that we call our super heavy class asteroid mining system, Queen Bee. And it'll be able to capture asteroids as big as 50 meters in diameter, which are thousands of metric tons. And it'll be be able to bring back a thousand tons of water at a time. So that's kind of what the asteroid mining roadmap looks like. Now, how do you mine an asteroid? Right. Well, your 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 queen bee or your honeybee vehicle flies to the asteroid and and rendezvous with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then typically asteroids are spinning. They're spinning too fast. They're not good candidates for mining. So there's a maximum spin rate that we can handle. And if it's a crazy sure. spin where it's tumbling on, on all different axes, probably not a good asteroid mining candidate. The good news is we can characterize the size, the rough shape, and the spin state of an asteroid using our Sutter telescopes. So we can do all the, the prospecting remotely. Nice. We fly up to the asteroid. We match spin sp- state to it. So if the asteroid is you know, spinning in this way, the spacecraft matches that. And then in the rotational coordinate system, there's no relative rotation between the two. There can be some mutation in the spinning object. As long as it's not too violent, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Then we fly the capture bag over the object and close it. If you go to our website at transastro.com mm-hmm. and look at the video gallery, you can see a time-lapse video of our capture bag capturing an object in simulated microgravity. And then we have actually a partnership with YKK. YKK is the biggest zipper, co- zipper company in the world. We have a robotic zipper that can close the bag, and then we can cinch it down. And then we use the same solar concentrators that power our omnivore solar thermal rocket. Actually, we have a, we have a moving mirror that can switch where the sunlight goes, and that moving mirror has been demonstrated, and it's actually in the mini vehicle that's out in the parking lot today. If you switch the mirror one way, you can test omnivore thrusters. If you switch it the other way, you can do experiments with asteroid mining of the same vehicle out in the parking lot today. Um, So we can, and then we can direct the sunlight directly into the capture bag to hit the the, the asteroid. And we've shown with dozens of tests in vacuum and in atmospheric conditions that sunlight can drill holes in rock material. In fact, I'm on the PhD committee of a student who's doing his PhD dissertation on how sunlight actually drills hole in rock. And there's a very sophisticated mathematical model behind how this works. And then we can validate that model with experiment. Um, so we can chew the asteroid up into little pieces using sunlight. And as we heat it, it releases water. That water is released into the bag, makes a, a small amount of pressure, way less than an atmosphere. And then we can have a secondary hole in the bag with a filter. And, the, and that water vapor goes through that secondary hole to a secondary bag. And that secondary bag will have, has a special surface treatment on it that makes it very cold. When the water hits the surface of that bag, it deposits it f- as frost. And we collect all that water up as a big ball of ice. Wow. And then we can release the asteroid in the original bag or eject it into space and then bring that propellant back and use that propellant as propellant to carry the rest of the propellant back. And we've done detailed mission studies on this and actually published it in the refereed uh, scientific literature. And you can, if you Google 
um, Professor Robert Jedicke is the first author. I'm the second author of the papers. Uh, you can actually read about the mission design and everything. Oh, Joel, that's incredible. Now, I know this is a, a difficult question probably to answer, but do you have an approximate timeline for, for what's next? Um, it's limited by funding. Sure. We can go pretty darn fast if we have the funding. So um, we... We, if we were not funding constrained, we need a couple of years to flesh out the technology and scale the vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, but we could easily be doing this within, we could be launching our first full-scale honeybee mission to mine an asteroid within five years, uh, funding constraint. It all depends sure. on how we're able to scale the company with our other businesses and what the investment community looks like. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, I do want to kind of uh, kind of wrap it up here. I have one final question for you, because you have this incredible, uh, incredible inspirational background, I think, you know, you, working at JPL, um, active with the Dawn spacecraft, among several other things, and of course, with uh, Transastra. You know, there's there's a lot of potential people out there right now listening or watching this that might have an interest in, in going into the field. Um, do you have any advice that you'll give them to succeed in this field? Um, you have to be very passionate about it and you have to focus and learn everything you can and, and don't take no for an answer. Um, when I graduated from college in the early 1980s, I wanted to start a company to build solar thermal rockets as upper stages for the space shuttle. And I was told by everyone, oh, you're too young. You can't do this. You have this job offer from JPL. Go to JPL. Get some experience. So I went to JPL, I got some experience. I picked up my PhD at Caltech. I started the Dawn. I started the NSTAR system that led to the Dawn spacecraft. Did a bunch of other things at JPL. It was a great experience, mm -hmm. but the best experience for running a company is to run a company. And um, in fact, I'm giving a lecture at the uh, University of Michigan next week. Um, I'm gonna be out there visiting uh, for various different reasons. And I have some collaborations with uh, professors at the University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, we, I was talking to them about giving a seminar. And I said, well, what would, what would the students or the faculty like to hear about in terms of a seminar? I could talk about how our optimized match filter tracking software multiplies the power of these inexpensive telescopes to find moving objects in space. I could talk about the gas dynamics of how the omnivore engine works. I could talk about the dynamics of how we capture objects in space with our capture bags, you know, lots of technical things I thought that they would be interested in. And they said, no, we want to hear your experience as a venture funded startup leader. Cause you know, this is my, this is my, uh, Transastra is my third of four companies I've founded. Wow. Um, and, uh, it's the second one, the second space technology company I've founded. The other one is now publicly traded. I was the founding CTO of a publicly of a now publicly traded company. Nice. They said we want to know what it takes to start a company and scale a company. Um, and so I'm gonna. It turns out that's what the graduate students and the faculty wanted to hear. So what I'm going to tell them is you got to focus on on four things. What I call the four T's. What's your unique technological advantage? How is your team unique and qualified and capable? What is the total addressable market? So technology, team, TAM, <laughs> what's the other, the other fourth T? Technology, team, TAM, and traction. Huh. Is it just an idea or do you actually have sales? If you put those four together in a great good old USA of A, investors will invest in your company. They will beat your door down to throw money at you. Um, but if you don't have all four, it's not going to happen. And how you get all four, that's, that's a trick. Joel, that is a great uh, segue and, and teaser, too, for those out there. But I, I really appreciate it, and that is great advice. And, Joel, I'm just really excited about Transastra and just want to really thank you for taking time to join me today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Chuck. Your space journey. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Joel today, and I'm really looking forward to the future of Trans Astra. Very exciting. If you'd like to learn more, just go to their website at transastra.com. 
want to thank Joel for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining me as well. Again, if you can do me a small favor and share this episode with a friend, I'd certainly appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'll see you next time. God bless.